I'm always on the hunt for products that will help me along my never-ending hair care journey, and a brand that I am so in love with is JVN from Jonathan Van Ness. One of the products I'm absolutely obsessed with is the Instant Recovery Serum. It's a deeply moisturizing hair primer that doesn't weigh my hair down at all. It fights frizz, and it protects against heat, so it's become such a big player in my routine. If you want to try JVN for yourself, and trust me, you definitely do, head to jvnhair.com and use the code ELISE20 for 20% off your entire JVN collection. Let's talk about mental health. If you feel like you might need support, HERS can help. At forhers.com, you can get access to healthcare providers who are available for your mental health and can prescribe trusted medications if they're right for you. It's 100% online. To get started, go to forhers.com slash Elise. That's forhers.com slash E-L-Y-S-E. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. Lemonada. What is the weirdest encounter I have ever had with a street artist? Great question. I would love to tell you. When I was in high school, I went on a road trip to San Francisco for like an entire week. A large group of my friends, my boyfriend, and myself slept in a very crowded hostel. And it actually allowed me to eat many chili bread bowls, more than like any human being has any business consuming in a seven-day period. Now, this trip was already rough to begin with. I started the week off telling a friend of mine that I would have been shocked if my boyfriend and I came out of this trip still dating. Let me just tell you right now, if that sentence comes out of your mouth before you have left for a trip with your significant other, just don't leave for the trip. Or you leave for the trip and you leave them not on the trip. Just don't don't take the trip together. But being 17 years old, I didn't have the wisdom that I do now at 29, so we went on the trip. (laughs) And let me tell you, it was exactly as bad as you would expect it to be. I spent the entire week having conversations about the impending breakup between me and my boyfriend with every single person except the person I was going to be breaking up with. So five days into this seven-day road trip, all of us are taking this beautiful leisurely stroll along the water in the Fisherman's Wharf. What I didn't know about this evening was that my entire friend group had decided ahead of time that me and my boyfriend would be communicating this evening. Whether we liked it or not, we would be having the conversation that we needed to have the entire week. Suddenly, I found myself in the back of the pack, standing next to Jason and being told to, quote, tell him what you told me. I take a deep breath. And then I quickly weigh the pros and cons of launching myself straight into the sea that's conveniently to my left, or I can sit down and strike up a conversation with a street artist that we're going to pass just like right up here. (laughs) I know one thing for sure, though. I am going to avoid having this conversation at all costs. I am all flight, no fight. I ran up to that street artist as if I had been searching for him my entire life. I say, I will give you $5, a kiss on the cheek, and the remaining leftovers of my chili bread bowl if you start painting a picture of me right now. What does this man do? He just starts painting no questions asked. No questions asked. By the grace of the fisherman's wharf, I have like narrowly escaped this conversation. I thought. Tell me why I thought getting a painting of my face would get me out of this conversation, because all I've done now is secured a spot in the conversation for the entire duration of the painting, and I've purchased a keepsake of it. Someone's painting the conversation happening in real time. This is my nightmare. This is my nightmare. So now I am trying to sit still enough for this man to paint me. I'm trying to break up with somebody. I'm being broken up with. And strangers are passing us on the street, watching it happen, because I think that they think that it's some type of street art. It is, just not on purpose. I am so focused at this point on the breakup at hand that I don't notice what the artist is actually painting. Until I catch a glimpse of a stranger looking at the canvas that I can't see. (laughs) I'm finally handed the picture. It's the solar system. He painted planets. I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't that. I feel so uncomfortable, both metaphorically and viscerally, physically, every possible way you can feel uncomfortable. I just hand my ex-boyfriend a picture of planets and say, I got you this as a parting gift. 
and I walk away. Thank you. Okay, actually, can you just pretend that you're listening to a fully complete theme song here? I got really in my head, and I tried to make it perfect, and I couldn't. So this is going to be the theme song right here. (laughs) Hi, welcome back to Funny Because It's True. I'm Elise Myers. Today, I'm going to be talking to one of the legendary cast members of Saturday Night Live, Kevin Nealon. If you don't know him from SNL, maybe you remember Hans and Franz? If that was before your time, he played Doug Wilson on the hit show series Weeds. Recently, Kevin's been producing and hosting the digital series Hiking with Kevin and tours his stand-up globally. He also just released his first book, I Exaggerate My Brushes with Fame, a book of caricatures he's drawn of celebrities and the stories that go with them. Two things that are funny because they're true. Number one, I still to this day don't think that I know how to correctly pronounce the word caricature. 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 And number two, beyond my better judgment, I asked Kevin to describe what my caricature would look like, and I'm happy to report he talked his way out of hurting my feelings. (laughs) And with that, let's get into it. Kevin Nealon, thank you so much for joining me. (laughs) Number one, I I know that you have a new book uh, coming out, and I would just love to kind of know how you started doing that, when you started with that concept. Like, when did that start for you? What what made you want to do that? Well, I never took art classes, but I just loved drawing. And when I was a kid, my parents had their caricatures drawn, and they are in my bedroom, framed separately. So every night I would go to bed kind of looking at them and kind of subconsciously studying yeah. how um, they were drawn. You know, I think, oh, look, maybe the nose big on him, and uh, look at the ears, you know. So I, I kind of knew that. Did you start with caricatures? That's like how you started doing it? I grew up reading Mad Magazine, so I liked all those caricatures. And then I would just do portraits of people, but they, they weren't that good, so they looked kind of like caricatures, right? But I am kind of just starting out in it. It's like anything else. The more you do it, the better you get. Yeah. So I've been doing that a lot. Do you say you draw? Yeah, kind of. It became something that I just do for fun. I think that when you're a creative person, you just kind of find new hobbies to do. Yeah. It's interesting because then you have those skills where people are like, why don't you monetize it? And you're like, because sometimes you just need a hobby, you know, especially when your whole world is monetizing your creativity. And I guess I would turn that question to you of like, why didn't you ever do art in that way? Because you loved it so much. Well, I'm really, I'm really hard on myself. I'm very critical. Yeah. Like I can't watch myself on television. Really? Yeah. Because I'm I'm not as good looking as I thought. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we are definitely our own worst critics. Yeah, it's it's painful yeah. sometimes how much you can like not believe in yourself when you're watching yourself know. perform something. No, even just yeah, even hearing my own voice, it's like really that's what I sound like. I relate so hard. <laughs> I really do. Yeah. I need someone to explain to me why our brains just sabotage us. Why are we our worst critics? Like, there has to be a point where you just say, Thank you so much, brain. That is not helpful because I don't need you to protect me from anything. I'm not in danger. In fact, I'm having the time of my life. So maybe just be quiet for a little bit and I will bring you back out when I need you. Do you think that there is any like comedy in caricature drawing? Do you think that having to find something to exaggerate helps with comedy or vice versa? And what kind of drawing? Like your caricatures. Did I say it wrong? No, no, you said it right. But it it sounded like kind of, it sounded fun the way you said it. (laughs) Okay, really quick. I have always been very self-conscious of the way that I pronounce words because I've always done it in like an exaggerated way, like um, button and, well, that's the only one I can think of right now. But um, yeah, there's always been words that I've said wrong that people will like repeat back to me when I say it. And as soon as they do that, I know that I have said something incorrectly. So this moment here, I was like, oh my God, it's happening. (laughs) It's like when somebody says subliminal, they usually never get it right. Or uh, ru- rural, 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 rural. I, I rural, never say yeah. that right. <laughs> right, rural or February. February. <laughs> I think it's going to be February. It should be January too. January. You know? It's funny because I tried to imagine when I was like thinking about talking to you what it would be like to draw a car- caricature, caricature. <laughs> um, now I'm going to think about it the whole time. And I think that like my fear of, um, 
exaggerating something of somebody would hold me back from doing it. And I think that there does have to be a confidence in your art or, or, or your comedy in some way. I, I really believe you have to be confident in that to make it and then present it to somebody because I would imagine you've made something for somebody and have they been offended? Like, what does that look like? You know, you were asking me about comedy and caricatures. I haven't developed a style yet either. You know, it's like with stand-up comedy, you start off and you're emulating somebody. And I'm just doing, you know, some kind of a style that a few of my friends do. But, um, but you know, like I said, the more you do it, the better off you are. And I just, I started really doing this, I get a little bit before the pandemic, but because I had nothing to do, I see mean, none of us did. I started doing a lot of these yeah. during the pandemic. And I realized that so they can't do stand-up comedy. This is more like um, it's it's nonverbal comedy. Yeah. Right? It's you draw these and people look at them, they laugh. And so that was fulfilling me for comedy during the pandemic. Did, so you started writing this book during the pandemic? Um, no, no. I was um, hiking with a friend of mine. He's a he's like a real motivator guy. Cool. He used to be the big trainer back in the eighties and nineties. Oh, cool. His name is Jake Steinfeld. And he, he had a program called Body by Jake, you know. Oh, oh my uh, gosh. Since, I know I know that program. <laughs> you did? Yeah. You did? <laughs> That's very famous. That's a very famous program. <laughs> yeah, right. So this guy's a motivator. You know, he's from Brooklyn. He talks like this, you know. And then, yeah. Let me tell you something, you know. I said, Jake, have you written any books? Oh, yeah, I wrote like 11 books. You're a ghostwriter, though, you know, ghostwriter. How about you? Have you read any books? I said, well, I wrote one about 15 years ago. It was kind of a memoir. It's called Yes, You're Pregnant, but what about me? Right. He says, you should write another book. You got any ideas? I said, yeah, I kind of do. You know, I have, I, I've been drawing a lot and uh, I have stories to go with each character I wrote because I either know them personally or if I don't know them like Freddie Mercury or Whitney Houston, I'll just muse about going to my first concert. Or yeah. Whatever. So he goes, all right, I'm going to call Jen. You know, she's a, this, she's a publisher in, uh, in Texas. She does Oprah's books, a lot of Christian books down there. They do well, they do well. <laughs> so right on a the trail there, he calls her puts me on with her and I tell her my idea. She goes, call me when you get home. So I called her and she was on board. She was an agent, not a publisher. So yeah, right on the spot. She said, let's do this. Do you like that kind of like interaction where you say something and someone's like, do it right now? Are, do you? Does that excite you or does that scare you? It does excite me. It does excite me. But I think you just have to be open to that. Yeah. Right? I like being around creative people. I like to go out to the clubs in Hollywood to do stand-up, but also to be around comedians, especially younger comedians, to see what's going on in the world, because I want to stay engaged and I don't want to be that older guy who doesn't really know, you know, <laughs> what TikTok is or whatever, you know. I think that with comedy too, so much of it is what's current. And I think that if you don't know what's going on or what's popular or what people are talking yeah. about, then you'll naturally fade out of that scene without even trying. The problem is if you don't stay engaged, and you're trying to fade away, you become a legend before you die. Mm. You know? Yeah. Sometimes people say I'm a legend. I say, no, 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 I'm still, I'm still out there doing it. I'm staying current. Yeah. You know? Okay, right here. Kevin doesn't want to become a legend while he's still working, that it's not his time to be a legend yet because he still wants to be like relevant. And this is very interesting to me. I have thought a lot about my legacy and what I want that to be at the end of my career. Everybody has a legacy, right? You don't have to be well known to leave a legacy. I think that I want to be known as somebody that creates space for people, that opens up myself in a way that people see their stories in my story to work things out that they've never worked out in their life and also allow them to kind of laugh about it once they've figured it out. Okay, <laughs> let's take a break. And when we get back, Kevin goes back in time to his SNL days. Hers wants you to know that you no longer have to manage your mental health alone. Hers offers access to mental health care that can support you in your day-to-day. -day. At ForHers.com, you can get access to healthcare providers who are available for your mental health and can prescribe trusted medications if they're right for you. And it's 100% online. If prescribed, you can get your first month of treatment for only $25 and afterwards for $85 a month or $49 a month with a three-month subscription. To get started, go to forhers.com slash Elise. That's forhers.com slash E-L-Y-S-E. 
Look, I know that getting access to the proper mental health care can sometimes be a source of stress in and of itself. That's why HERS makes it simple. Get started today at forhers.com slash Elise. That's forhers.com slash E-L-Y-S-E. Offer only available if prescribed. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Subscription required. Additional restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. Grocery shopping is something that I struggle to find time to do, but with Thrive Market, I stress less because I get everything I need and so much more in one place. And it's all delivered right to my door seamlessly. Just browsing their website and app, you will quickly notice the quality of items along with great bonus offers and discounts. Thrive Market has everything from pantry essentials to frozen meals, non-toxic cleaning and beauty products, and even items for your pet. When you buy from Thrive Market, you can save up to 30% off the best organic groceries. My favorite thing from Thrive is their boxed cold brew. Jonas and I get it and keep it in our fridge and just drink it throughout the week. It's so good. Also, their website and app are so easy to use. You can filter to find exactly what you want, maybe gluten-free, maybe zero waste, maybe BIPOC-owned brands. I personally save a bunch of time when I'm looking for those fruit and veggie pouches for my son. He loves them, and Thrive has so many options to choose from. Get convenient, high quality affordable groceries delivered with Thrive Market. Join Thrive Market today and get a free $60 gift. Go to T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash Elise to get a free $60 gift. That's thrivemarket.com slash E-L-Y-S-E. So transitioning over to SNL and that whole world, like how long did you do stand up before you got onto SNL? Well, I got on SNL in 1986. So I had been doing stand-up probably for about seven years. Okay. And then um, I got on another big show called The Tonight Show in 1984. So that was five years after doing stand-up. And I didn't know how to do sketches or anything. And my friend Dana Carvey recommended me for the show. And so um, I went for an audition. And I got really tired when I walked in there because I used to fall asleep watching that show. Oh. <laughs> it was an association thing. Your you know? brain's like, isn't it bedtime? Uh, it, <laughs> I know, right? Plus the stress. I get really tired when I'm stressed. Interesting. Somebody asked me once, "Is you have stage fright? I said, I don't think so. And then I realized I get really tired before I go on. I'm yawning and I want to lay down. And I think that's a form of stage fright because your body is shutting down yeah. and it's kind of preparing for battle, right? Okay, really quick, this form of stage fright that Kevin's talking about where he's like a sleepy, nervous person, I don't know why this is striking me as so funny because obviously when I get very nervous, I over talk, I sweat through my shirt. Sometimes I can have a panic attack. I will start to stutter like really bad. And I've never experienced stuttering so much in my life until this season of my life where I'm doing so many things I'm scared of pretty much every day. Um, So the fact that he like goes onto stage and just starts yawning, does not compute with my brain in any way. I just, I couldn't relate any less to this feeling that he is having um, with stage fright. Okay, keep going. Either it's like all adrenaline, it's like fight or flight, but your flight is sleeping. <laughs> yeah, that's right. My flight is kind of like waiting on the ground to take yeah. off. Yeah. So anyway, I auditioned for that show and um, I flew back to California thinking, oh, that's not going to work. And then you know, a week later, they called me and said, come to New York. Because for SNL, when you audition, don't you have to have characters kind of in your pocket ready to take out or no? Back then, it was still a little rough, you know, with that. And I think Lauren at the time wanted more of the chemistry. I mean, they were coming off a season that was really poor ratings and they were about to pull the plug on the show. Oh, wow. So we all came in. Dan and I were friends and I was dating Jan Hooks at the time. We had been friends for a long time. So we were, a lot of us were friends. And we knew kind of each other's comedy. So I went there and I just started learning how to write sketches and how to do, you know, characters. Did you experience any, I guess, sleepy stage fright when you were actually on filming the show? Or was that more just for the stand-up? Yeah, no, the first couple of years, it's terrifying. I remember the first sketch I did, it was called Mr. Subliminal, where I would insert words, uh, which I learned from, I have a marketing degree in BS, so I learned about <laughs> um, subliminal advertising, you know. So that was my first sketch ever. And I'm about to go on. They're away to commercial break. And they're coming back like in 10 seconds. And this is kind of a complicated sketch because you've got two conversations going on at once. And I've never done a sketch before on TV. So I was kind of nervous. And then five seconds before we're supposed to go on, 
uh, Lorne Michaels, comes up to me and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he looked at me and he goes, are you sure this is what you want? <laughs> so he was, he was kidding. You know, he was teasing, trying to make me feel uh, less nervous. That was a great impression of him, though, by the way. That was like, he's in the room with us. <laughs> yeah, everybody does learn. When, you, when you're writing, what, I guess, would your process have been to create a character from scratch? Well, Mr. Subliminal used to do my act. So I got to go to Val Franken, and, and we wrote that up. And uh, Hans and Franz, um, and Dana and I, we were on the road together with Dennis Miller, like after the first season. And we were in a hotel, a red line in, in Des Moines, Iowa. And um, I was watching Arnold Schwarzenegger on a show. Uh, Showtime was called Up Close and Personal. Mm -hmm. And they were interviewing Arnold. They said, Arnold, what do you like to do when you go to a town? You're kind of on the road, you know. He goes, you know, first I like to get, you know, to like concert or something like that, you know, and then I go out of the town. And then, uh, you know, when I come back to the hotel, I get into the nice light cotton sheets, you know, things like that. And I called Dana. I said, Dana, you got to watch Schwarzenegger. This guy's a riot. And for the rest of the tour, we, you know, we were talking like Arnold, you know. And we thought we got to come up with some characters like this before next season. So we got into a room and we just started spitballing ideas. And I used to live in Germany. You know, I, I knew the names. You know, the Germans like this Hans and it rhymes with Franz. Well, that's what you do is you rhyme the names. Sure. Writing those two characters made us laugh more than anything else because they were just two pathetic, defensive pseudo bodybuilders who never lifted a weight in their life. <laughs> And they felt like such losers, but they were trying to cover it. You know, you know, if you think you're so smart, you know, why don't you come over here and you know, show us your belly flap? If you took your belt off, you cause a flap of lunch. That's right, you know. And uh, we just act whatever it was. You know, if you think you're, you know, if you think you're such a good guitar player, you know, let me see you put it on your lap. You know, your belly would keep it off your lap. Nice one, Hans. Nice one. Yeah, you do nice one. You know. Hold on, 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 hold on. Kevin Nealon is telling me how he created the characters Hans and Franz. Okay, I actually can't believe this conversation is happening. This, I, oh my God, I can't even form a sentence. <laughs> my dad's not even going to believe that this conversation happened until he hears it with his own earballs. These are the kind of things that I would buy box DVD sets for and like try and find like behind the scenes interviews about these characters that I grew up watching on Saturday Night Live, like these are the kinds of things that I spent my whole day watching and these stories I would consume and like look up to and want to write and think maybe one day I'll get to do this. And now Kevin Nealon is just like telling me these things to my face, technically to a computer that is presenting his face to my computer. And then we're talking through the technology, which is also a whole, a whole thing that doesn't make sense to my brain. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I don't, oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Resume. And then we had the sweatsuits that were so outdated. Oh. And then one day, you know, after like, they became kind of popular, Arnold wanted to come on and be in a sketch, you know, with Hans and Franz. So we couldn't believe it. We looked at each other and we said, doesn't he know we're making fun of him? And uh, then we realized he's probably coming on the show to kill us. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> So that they arrived and they came and they got us. They said, Arnold's in his dressing room. He wants to see you guys. And we were like two kids going to the principal's office. This is, it's over, man, it's over. And so we get to his dressing room and his name is on the door, Arnold Schwartz. It was so long. It like, that doesn't the, fit. The name went over onto the wall. You had to go onto the wall a little bit. And I remember we opened up the door. It was full of cigar smoke. Oh and we could barely see him sitting across the room, you know, holding a big cigar. And he looks up through the smoke to us. He goes, Hello, fellas. Now, how am I supposed to do the accent? <laughs> <laughs> so right then we knew we had a sense of humor. And I, I love when people are able to do that. People are taking your voice and making it into a character. You could either get so angry at it that you like shit talk people about it, or you can just join in on it. It's that makes me happy. I'm so glad. Oh, yeah. I mean, people are really flattered when you make fun of them on that show. Yeah. <clears throat> they can't believe it. You know, you can't even even Sarah Palin. She came on the show after Tina Fey made so much fun of her. She came on the show and was part of it. A lot of people have done that. And they love that it is pop culture and it brings a lot of attention to them and their cause or whatever. Have you ever made a character of from somebody you know in your real life and just never told them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A couple times. I guess I can't uh, really ask, but <laughs> who it is? 
No, I, you know, I know a writer friend of mine. I haven't seen him in a long time, but, you know, he was a, a very, he used to be a stockbroker. And he would talk like this, you know, um, you like that? That's funny, right? You think I'm funny, don't you? you right? That was funny, right? You know, he would talk like that. It was very really scary. You, you like me, right? You think I'm funny? Mm-hmm. Is that funny? That was funny, wasn't it? So I wrote, I wrote something like that. It didn't get on, but for the, you know, for like a year or two, the writers would be using it to me. That's funny, right? That's funny. You like that, Scramps? That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Another one was this, uh, this Brooklyn guy that we knew. Dana and I knew this guy. He used to be a trainer. He had a gym in, in New York. He's from Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, he had everything figured out in life. You know, he goes, you know, let me tell you something. You know, you, you're not 25, 26, 27, 28 years of age anymore. You got to understand, how many good summers do you think you have left in this life? How many more sunsets are you going to see? <laughs> so we like that guy. That would be just like so overwhelming because I think I would just get in my head and start spiraling. Like you're actually, you're, you're so right. <laughs> I'm dying soon. Like, yeah. like I have to live my life. So I heard a fun fact that um, Chris Farley was somebody who got you the closest to like breaking character when you were on SNL. Is that true? Yeah, I kind of like prided myself that I never broke character oh, on that yeah. show because Lauren hated that. He said it was kind of like the Carol Burnett show. I don't know if you know that show. Yeah, or yeah, that, yeah. And then they would break all the time. Yeah, they're always laughing. And that's fun for the audience, you know, but it gets to that point where you know it's going to get a laugh, so you kind of are open to it and you start doing it. And and it takes away from the sketch, too. Yeah. I mean, the writers wrote really hard to make a good, funny sketch. And then now it's not about the sketch. It's about, you know, Horatio Sands or whoever cracking up. And um, so I never broke character, and I was proud of that. And then comes the um, Chippendale dancer (laughs) sketch with Chris Farley, right? And I'm one of the judges. That's me and Jan Hooks and Mike Myers who's a judge. We have clipboards. It's like American Idol. We're behind the the desk, and he's auditioning for a Chippendale dancer against Patrick Swayze. This is like one of my favorite sketches, by the way, (laughs) just so you know. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah, a lot of people like that one. I think it's probably one of the best sketches ever. And uh, Patrick Swayze is like, you know, he's caught. He's got six packs all over him, you know, from the back. He's got six packs, a face six pack. Uh, <laughs> cheek six pack. And, yeah, yeah, everywhere. <laughs> so they're dancing and, you know, obviously Chris Farley's just his belly sloshing back and forth, you know, yeah. he's dancing and get into it. And every time I looked up, I had to look down again because I would have started laughing. And I barely got through that. That sketch, but I did get through it. So you didn't end up breaking? No, came close to it, though. So you literally never broke on SNL? One time, I think I did with Chevy Chase at the Weekend Update thing, but only because he couldn't read the cue cards, uh. and he kept stumbling over his lines. <laughs> and I you know, I was he, always a huge fan of Chevy Chase, as I modeled my uh, Weekend Update after him, yeah. the character he did. And so to see him like that, I just, it was funny to me. And am I right in knowing that you kind of popularized the Weekend Update? Yeah, I mean, there were so many people that did it. And Chevy Chase, if anybody popularized, popularized it, popular, Pop- popularized. popularized it, popularized it. And uh, February. February. Brewery. <laughs> brewery. 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 Hey, you want to go to the brewery? No, you're already drunk. Brewery. <laughs> brewery. Another one is edited yeah. it. it. Like if you, did you edit it? Edited it. it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Edited Edit, it. If I, yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so yeah. So there was a lot of great, uh, we can update Norm McDonald did a great job and Tina Fey, of course. And, you know, I think Chevy Chase probably was the one that started it all. So it's always been like the pivotal moment in that show, you know, kind of like the middle of the show. Amazing. And uh, it was interesting too, because they would roll out the set right in the middle in front of the main stage. And then you're away at commercial and they're hustling to get the backdrop up and they get the desk in there and they bring you up there, you know, and you get ready, you got your papers, got your pencil, and then you got like another minute where you're ready, but the audience is just looking at you. That's so you awkward. <laughs> it's just awkward. And, you know, and you're kind of looking down like you're doing work. And then my go-to thing was I would have a piece of paper and I'd be down on it and I'd be looking at an audience member like I was sketching them. And then five seconds before they come back from the commercial. I would hold up the sketch, and it was like a stick figure of the person. You know, after yeah, and then I get a laugh from that, and so that laugh would carry over into me. You know, and they were in a good mood. They knew I was kidding around and stuff. You know, that's really smart. So that was my little. That was my secret. That's really smart. I feel like that that 
minute silence and pause would completely shut me down. I'm like very not good at crowds. And everyone asks me if I would ever do stand up and like, absolutely not. That's just like, not, I can't, I will, I will shut down in every way. So it's smart. You used it. You were the longest standing cast member when you left, right? Now it's been surpassed by a few, yeah. but you were on for how many seasons or how many years? I was on for nine seasons. And, you know, and as it got um, further along, I got more and more comfortable to the point where, you know, I decided it was time to leave when I was going out and doing sketches. I still had food in my mouth from the craft service table, you know. You just make it a part of the character. You're like, oh, I was supposed to be eating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But more than that, it was just that showed that I was kind of bored with the show. We're taking another break, and up next, Kevin tells me about drawing celebrities like Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Buzz Aldrin. If you're anything like me, you're always on a journey with your hair and finding products that work for you. That's why I love today's sponsor, JVN. This brand is from Jonathan Van Ness, and it's packed with science-backed ingredients that make your hair so gorgeous. Plus, it's good for all hair types. JVN hair care is silicone-free and powered by this really cool sustainable ingredient, hemisqualine. It gives you healthier, frizz-free hair instantly and over time. I personally love their air dry cream. It provides like the perfect amount of moisture to my curls, but is also lightweight enough to not feel like it weighs them down. Bonus points, it smells incredible. If you want to try JVN's air dry cream for yourself, and trust me, you definitely do, head to jvnhair.com and use the code ELISE20 for 20% off air dry cream and the entire JVN collection. That's jvnhair.com and code ELISE20. ButcherBox takes all the guesswork out of finding high-quality meat and seafood that you can trust. They offer 100% grass-fed beef, free-range organic chicken, crate-free pork, and wild-caught seafood delivered right to your door. With ButcherBox, everything is humanely raised with no antibiotics or added hormones. Also, ButcherBox has been super convenient. I am really excited at the idea of not having to scour a bunch of labels and then wait in line and lug a bunch of heavy bags home from the grocery store. Also, props to ButcherBox for having truly the most unique promotional offer I have ever heard in my life. Are you ready? The main course for Thanksgiving dinner can sometimes be the most stressful part of the holiday. Not anymore. ButcherBox is offering our listeners free turkeys with their first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash E-L-Y-S-E and use code Elise to get one 10 to 14 pound turkey free in your first box. That's butcherbox.com slash E-L-Y-S-E and use code Elise to claim this deal. Did I ever think that my first name would be used as a code for a free turkey? <laughs> Absolutely not, but I love it. I just admire stand-up comics and people that perform because it scares the hell out of me. I, <laughs> yeah, I just don't, I don't know how I could, how I could do it. That is frightening. But, uh, you know, you feel really good once you confront your fear yeah. and you do it. It's like I woke up, you know, like eight years ago. I just turned 60. And I thought, man, it's going by fast, especially now. I thought I want to do all the things that I talked about all my life and things that scared me. Yeah. And enough already. I'm, you know, uh, enough of the rehearsals. You know, let's do things now. Let's do it. And one of them was like, being a guest on the Howard Stern show because he terrified me, yeah. his, his interviews, you know, and he would make fun of SNL and all of us on there. So I did that and it was just like, you know, I was flying high afterwards because it was like it was so fun and he was so respectful and, you know, we had a great conversation and like Bennett's like four times since then. The other thing was real time with Bill Maher because I'm not a political pundit. So I had to like bone up on all that stuff. And then I went on there and I like, did really well. Like I did three or four episodes. So, and then that's why I start doing all this other stuff, you know, like doing these caricatures and putting them up and I'm having a gallery showing oh my um, gosh. December. That's so amazing. Yeah. I know. Right. I got a book coming out now and I'm taking Spanish and I'm learning how to play the piano because, you know, you know, you're not 61, 62, 63, 64 years of age anymore. How many good, How many summers? good summers do you think you have left? <laughs> I, uh, I have a saying where I, everything I'm doing right now, talking to you, doing this podcast, everything has just made me so scared. And I, 
it doesn't get easier. You just do get more experienced at feeling those, those things and pushing through it. I did, I had one more question for you. I was like looking through the, um, like the images that you've drawn. And I noticed that like most of them are people that you are like friends with and have personal relationships with. But then I saw (laughs) there was Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Buzz Aldrin. Um, yeah. How did that, how have you, are you friends with them? How does, well, I used to date uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Okay. And <laughs> no, um, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg I did because she was so popular, and then she passed away. Yeah. And so she had an interesting face, so that's why I drew her. Buzz Aldrin I drew because I met him on a beach in, in Mexico. Hold on. I talked to him for a while. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I went on some charity-like thing. And there's a bunch of like uh, celebrities, and I guess he was part of it. I didn't know he was part of it, but he was on a beach. This was in Puerto Vallarta, and all of a sudden I see him. I go, "Is that Buzz Aldrin?" <laughs> You're like, "It can't and be." It was. He, yeah, he's there with his wife, and I went up to him, and I said, "Oh my God, I, what an honor to meet you!" And you were, man. Well, can I just ask you a question? What, what was it like, you know, walking on the moon? I mean, were you ever like scared you won't get off the moon? He said. And he was serious. He looked at me. He goes, "What are you, a wise guy?" I said, "No, no." Well, and I thought, "Why would he say that to me?" And I said, "No, I, I was just curious because if if I was on the moon, I'd be scared that I wouldn't be able to get off." He said, "Why, why, why wouldn't I get off?" See, he's a rocket scientist, and everything's figured out. He doesn't question anything, right? So I said, "I don't know. I, I thought I, maybe the lunar module wouldn't start. I know sometimes I get into my car; it doesn't start." He goes, "Well." We did get into the module, and we noticed that one of the fuses was sticking out. So we called Houston. They said, just push it back in. And we did, and just took off. We just called Houston. So, we just gave him a quick dial. Yeah. Hey, Houston. Yeah. <laughs> Never meet your heroes, kids. Just don't do it. Just don't meet them. And <laughs> hear, hearing the story of, of Kevin meeting Buzz on the beach, Buzz on the beach, as if me and Buzz are like buddies. Like, what's up, Buzz? <laughs> okay, anyways. Also, Buzz Aldrin and Buzz Lightyear. Did anyone make that connection? It's probably not a connection that needs to be made, but I got sidetracked. Okay, anyways. So that was that. So there's a lot of stories in the book um, like that. You know, my interaction with those people, like, you know, Eddie Vedder used to come and watch me do stand up oh at the improv in San Diego. He would be surfing during the day. And he told me he would come there and watch me. He was one of his favorite comedians. But then I find out later his girlfriend worked there as a server. So that's kind of really why he was going there. But anyway, so there's a lot, a lot of those stories. And uh, the book, uh, it is called I Exaggerate My Brushes with the Fame. Yeah. People can pre-order it now if they'd like. And then the hiking show I do comes out um, October 27th. And I have a lot of great guests. What is the hiking show called? Oh, it's called Hiking with Kevin. Hiking. That's on YouTube. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. And uh, yeah, every week I hike with a different celebrity. And we hike in all the canyons of LA and Malibu. And I've had you know, everyone from, you know, Owen Wilson to Adam Sandler on there. And this year I've got like Paul Rudd and Julian Lennon and um, Nora Jones and Eugene Levy. And uh, and it's just fun. I, I love it. I, oh my gosh. I like, I just want to ask all the questions. I know that's like not what I'm supposed to ask, but I how like, has that always been a passion of yours to kind of interview people and, and chat? Is it, are these like friends that it started as friends and then it grew into this? Like, well, yeah, you're, yeah, it did. Exactly. It started as friends. I was hiking with Matthew Modine from Stranger Things. Yeah. We were hiking just here in Canada. I hadn't seen him in a while. So we we're talking a lot and we're getting up high and it's getting really steep and we're both kind of you know, out of breath and, and, you know, we could barely understand each other, <laughs> you know? And, uh, I thought this would be funny to videotape, like a like an interview yeah. show where we were both so tired. So I got my camera out. I go, so Matthew, are you when you came to Holly, Hollywood, did you have an Asian? Yeah. Well, Kevin, yeah, I did. Yeah. So then I posted it on Twitter at the time, and uh, people loved it. And I thought maybe I should hike with somebody different every week. Yeah. So I got went through all my friends, and then I ran out of friends, and I started you know emailing publicists asking if I could go with their clients and. It just snowballed, and it was like Hans and Franz. It became more and more popular, and people want to do it now, and and I enjoy it. I oh just gosh, congratulations. Um, I, I, That's so cool. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you can watch it on YouTube, yeah. and you can see like I mean, over a hundred hikes I've done so far. I uh, I have one good question. I know we're running out of time, but um, going back to the caricature 
if, and you, I feel free to not answer this too, but if you were to draw one of me, what would be the characteristic of my face <laughs> that you were like, that's what I'm going to hone um, in on? Well, it's interesting because when I started doing these, everybody that I walked by, I could see their, their, their caricature thing I would exaggerate. Yeah. And it's like now I'm walking in a fun house with mirrors. Everybody I look at, I see the caricature of their face. Interesting. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you, I mean, it's very, very, I have to really tread lightly. No, no, when, no. I, um, I will cry about it later, but it's okay. <laughs> well, you know, your face, you know, there's nothing that really stands out. And you, very plain, very, Just very average. Just a very <laughs> normal face. Just yeah, nothing to write normal. home about. <laughs> yeah. I, I love how kind you were. And I know if you were to draw it, you would just find it. And so thank you so much, though, for being so flattering in that caricature. Of, of, of yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's true. Okay, hold on. I have never actually seen caricatures as comedy until this conversation with Kevin Nealon. Watching Kevin talk about this skill he has, it is this form of nonverbal comedy. So yeah, I, I think that this has kind of changed the way that I see these drawings. And yeah, you just, I, oh, this is really, really fascinating. Okay. Thank you so much for today. I can't wait to read your book. Yeah. And the hiking show comes out October 27th, but people could still see it on you. They could see the past season. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. Okay. I yeah. can't, I'm going to get off this call and immediately go watch an episode. Cause I think that's so fun. Oh, sweet. I would love to chat all about all that stuff. I just have so many questions. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. Yes. Kevin, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. If you would have told 10-year-old Elise that I would be having this conversation today with Kevin Nealon, I would have thought that you were out of your mind. Dad, if you're listening, <laughs> this episode is for you. <laughs> I grew up watching SNL my entire life. Um, I own like box sets, like DVDs of the best of from every major comedian that has come through SNL. I definitely watched like Hans and Franz and the Chippendale skit that we talked about and the fact that Kevin Nealon has made a book with this art that he at one point was very unsure of and very insecure about and is having a gallery showing of this art is beautiful. That's a beautiful representation of doing something scared. Also, the fact that there's so much comedy laced into these drawings, there's so much history with these stories that he's telling with his friends and people that he's had random encounters with on a beach, like Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's very inspiring to me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Make sure that you check out Kevin's new book, I Exaggerate, My Brushes with Fame, out now. If you haven't already, rate and review the show to help more people find it. Thanks. Be back next week. Bye. If you want more Funny Cause It's True, just subscribe to Lemonada Premium on Apple Podcasts for some exclusive bonus content. Funny Cause It's True is a Lemonada Media and Powder Keg production. The show is produced by Claire Jones, Zoe Dennis, Nancy Rosenbaum, and Linnea Tony. Our associate producer is Tiffany Bowie. Rachel Neal is our senior director of new content, and our VP of weekly production is Steve Nelson. Executive producers are Stephanie Whittles-Wax, Jessica Cordova-Kramer, Paul Feig, Laura Fisher, Kesla Childers, and me, Elise Myers. The show is mixed by Brian Castillo and Johnny Vince Evans. Additional help from Noah Smith and Ivan Karayev. Our theme song music was written by me and scored by Xander Singh. Hey, Lemonada listeners, we want to hear from you. You know we love our sponsors for a ton of reasons, but one of the main ones is that they help us keep the lights on. And there's a really easy way that you can help us draw new advertisers and hear ads for things you're most interested in. Filling out our quick anonymous survey at lemonadamedia.com slash survey. By just answering a few questions, you can help us find new brands to connect with and also share feedback about show content you'd like to see across the network. And to sweeten the deal, once you've completed the survey, you can enter for a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. I promise the survey is short and sweet and will help us play ads you don't want to skip and also keep bringing you content you love. Just go to lemonadamedia.com slash survey. 
BFFs Kula Palaisak and Zujin Pak bring heartfelt, hilarious, and sometimes subversive conversations about consuming and consumers to add to cart. This podcast explores what they and we buy and buy into. Who knew a confession about buying a fast fashion chili pepper swimsuit could segue into a conversation about body positivity? Kulap and Sujin will make you laugh, cry, and take a closer look at what you do and don't buy. Listen to Add to Cart wherever you find your podcasts. Casts. 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 Casts.